I thought to cover a couple of aspects around the uh, very important topic on pensions. Uh, first one, briefly, why this is really important, uh, and I can't stress that too much, because, I mean, pensions, it's a boring topic, uh, and that's part of the issue. I mean, we typically only think about it when, when it's basically too late. <laughs> I'll come back to that. Uh, then a couple of examples from the Nordic countries. I'm heading the exchange in, in, in Helsinki, so that's the market I know best. I also know some uh, on the Swedish setup, so a couple of examples on which I think are important in the context of, of PEP. And then to end, end uh, a couple of notes on, on how to make PEP successful. And I plan to discuss that by taking up a couple of uh, issues that might be uh, what I think we need to focus on to, to get BEP really to, uh, to make an impact. But uh, first on the need, I, I, I think it's quite obvious. I mean, Quite like we, we just heard, the current uh, pensions uh, market in Europe is very fragmented. Uh, so obviously with PEP, if it succeeds, we will be getting clearly more providers, uh, more kind of a uh, level playing field in the sense that at best I would say PEP creates a quality stamp. A little bit like the SME growth market uh, initiative, uh, part of the Capital Markets Union. To me, it's a quality stamp. I, it, as I see it, PEP, when successful, it's, it's, it's for the consumers, it's kind of a assurance that the product that they're looking at actually uh, contains some key features that help ensure that it's, it's a long-lasting uh, good product. And obviously, the cost aspect, it's very important. I can't stress that too much. Uh, it's, especially important in long-term savings. Even the kind of slightest changes in the cost, annual cost structure, makes a huge impact if your saving time is 30 to 40 years. So hopefully BEP will address the kind of transparency of the cost aspect as well. And then perhaps most importantly, uh, with BEP, I would expect to see uh, the EU moving away from the kind of uh, bank savings culture into a equity investment culture, as we call it i.e. that with PEP hopefully we'll see more of the savings because we have a lot of savings as we just heard in the EU but the savings are to a, lot, to, to a large degree I would say on, held on bank accounts and that hopefully will change with PEP because certainly at least historically the returns on equity investment and I want to stress direct equity, equity investment has, have been clearly the highest across all various uh, alternative assets that you can think of. So, uh, hopefully PEP will actually move more savings into equities where the returns are the highest and thereby the, uh, the long-term uh, accumulated uh, savings obviously also the highest. Uh, and of course from the provider point of view we have a lot of I guess uh, pension providers in the room today so, so at best I mean if the, the forecast uh, really uh, materializes, then certainly it's, a, it's an attractive idea to see three times more uh, pension savings uh, within the next, whatever it was, 10 years. So, so that's of course a bigger market for everybody. Uh, and of course the scale impact, certainly being able to provide services across the EU. Though then again from a local point of view, and I, I believe one of the topics today is to think about ways to, from a Baltic point of view, from a Nordic point of view, how can we succeed in this competition? And there, my main point would be that we need to, like in many other EU initiatives, we need to have our home base, our home country uh, in, in good shape for us to succeed in, in this competition. Because the moment you create a pan-European market for whatever topic, then it of course means that uh, for you, your national country, to actually succeed in the race, and in this case, the race for investments, of course you need to have uh, a lot of things in place in your home country uh, that then attract people to actually invest money in long-term savings. And then we start talking about incentives and uh, I'll, I'll come back to that with the examples from the, from the Nordic countries. Uh, and, and, and this is my second point. So a couple of examples from the Nordics. Uh, first, a, a success story from Sweden. And I have to say, I don't, I don't enjoy telling this as uh, there is some level of uh, friendly competition between Finland and Sweden. 
But, uh, but Sweden certainly has got this right when it comes to uh, incentivizing people to, 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 to save long term. I mean, the, 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 uh, the one thing I'd like to start with is that, uh, that in Sweden, already for uh, I think more than 20 years now, uh, the Swedes have been allowed to decide on their Pillar 1 savings uh, to a small degree, but still, they're able to decide how their, uh, the mandatory pension savings are actually invested. So they can choose the, choose the fund. It's, it's, I think it's only like 5 or 10 percent of the fund, so no matter how badly you choose, you will never be uh, bankrupt at, uh, at retirement. But, but that, to me, has uh, been the kind of cornerstone in, in, in creating an equity savings culture and a culture where people actually understand and know what it means to save in funds or equities. And that's, of course, where it all starts, because if you don't know what it means to invest, uh, then I mean, why would you why would you go 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 and do it? So uh, so 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 that to me has been the starting point for the Swedish success story. Another thing that they did well in Sweden was back in 2012 they implemented a investment savings account, which is a model where you can very tax efficiently actually invest directly in shares. So far in the last seven years, more than three million people in Sweden with a population of 10 plus million. So a pretty big chunk of the total population has opened this kind of an account. And this account only makes sense if you actually uh, actively trade shares. So this, in turn, has then resulted in a, in a market in Sweden where also small, small cap companies, SMEs, can actually successfully list. And that, then again, is relevant for this topic as well, because that, of course, means that there are, uh, there are investment cases for people to invest in. So it's all, in a way, related. It's all kind of part of the successful ecosystem, as we like to call it. Uh, and then again, that brings us to the tax aspect again. I.e. taxation needs to incentivize people to save long term. Without incentives, it's not going to happen. And, uh, and as an example of that, uh, I, I, I turned to, to, to Finland, uh, where we, uh, back in 2010, we introduced a, uh, what, was, or what is still called a, a PS account, it's for long term savings account. It uh, had a good start. The local banks uh, started offering these kind of uh, products. It's a voluntary product where you, you get certain tax incentives if you commit to saving long term for your pension. The start was quite okay, but then the government intervened and changed the terms of the program, i.e. the current terms are pretty harsh. You, uh, you need to wait until you're 68, until you, 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 uh, you, you can actually start with, with withdrawing funds from the account and also you, uh, you can only draw them uh, within a minimum of 10 years. And then again, you can only, I think annually, the tax incentive is only 1,700 euros anymore. So the government went in and changed the terms uh, during the program, and that basically stopped people from using it. So uh, the last official statistics show that we only have 30,000 such accounts in Finland with a, a nation of 5.5 million people. Compare that against the number of 3 million in uh, Sweden with this uh, investment savings accounts. So that to me is just an example of how it's end of day, it's all about incentives. Without the proper incentives, and then again, needless to remind you, it's, the incentives are fully, currently at least, on a national level. So that would be perhaps my main point. Uh, there is so much that can be done on a member state level to actually incentivize people to invest in uh, long term savings. The EU can, of course, help with these kind of products like, like the PEP by raising awareness and, uh, and trying, to make, trying to lower the threshold. But at the end of the day, I would say it's, it's a lot on the member state level. Uh, another uh, somewhat controversial example is that, uh, that I just over the weekend, uh, the Easter weekend, I, I, I saw a news story that last year uh, the net investment by Finns into mutual funds and equities was only 42 euros on average. 42 euros was the net investment into equities and mutual funds. And at the same time last year, uh, an average Finn spent 570 euros on the state-owned state uh, gambling products. So more than 10 times the amount that they spent on mutual funds and equities. They, they, they gambled on the, you know, we call it uh, lotto, and finish the, the uh, weekly lottery. Uh, and of course, that money was lost. 
And the state owned company spent 60 million euros in Finland to advertise, to market the, the gambling product. And I would claim that the equivalent number that the government spends in advertising long-term pensions products is zero. <laughs> so, so again, I mean, it's, it's all about... And then again, we need incentives to invest long-term because we are... Inherit, inherently, we are short-term creatures. We, we want our rewards now. We don't want to wait 10 years or 20 years to actually get it. So, uh, so, so that's really... Uh, and of course, with the more kind of proper words, I mean, financial literacy is key. People need to know what it means to actually save and the miracle of compounded interest rate, i.e. that how you can make money work for you if you, if you uh, save long term. So obviously, also there are a lot that the member states can, can do. Uh, then just briefly on the kind of potential issues uh, with the pet product, of course, as mentioned multiple times already, tax incentives, I mean, that's key. Uh, the standardization, I think, is another key element, but that's a tricky one because uh, on one hand I understand the need for a kind of simple product uh, to basically make it easy for people to buy into, but then again it, I'm afraid it might easily become too restrictive for the providers as well. So that to me is, a, is, a, is one of the key topics that I think we need to get right on the kind of implementation phase. That it's, it's standardized enough but still leaves room for uh, for innovation and, uh, and kind of uh, different uh, options. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's see, portability wise, uh, yeah, quite like was mentioned, uh, obviously the starting point seems to be quite limited. I understand it's enough uh, if, if you have portability into, into just one uh, additional country uh, in addition to your home market. So that, that still leaves room for a lot of uh, improvement there. The, uh, the able to change investment options only every five years, that to me is quite uh, restrictive. Uh, I would very much like to see products where you can, preferably you can change investment options perhaps on a daily basis if you want to, or, or at least it should be like something like monthly or, or annually. Uh, every five years to me is quite limiting uh, as an uh, as uh, investment option changes. Good. So these, I think, are my prepared notes. So again, main point to me is, is the member state level tax incentives. That really makes or breaks the pet product, as I see it. Thank you for your attention.